The general field of Armenian studies, and specifically those who focus on the Armenian genocide in the period leading up to it, have been rather tardy in taking into account the similar and interrelated experiences of their neighbors and sometime Hanamis, the Assyrians. This is uh, a generalization, of course, but clearly there's a long way to go, and we have much to learn from each other. Some of the commonalities between Assyrians and Armenians are just part of our common humanity, but others are the result of similar and indeed very closely connected common histories. Like many Armenians, uh, for many Armenians, Assyrians call to mind the writings of William Saroyan. There's the titular character in the long short story, The Assyrian. There is the first story in My Name is Aram, the wonderful, the summer of the beautiful white horse with the farmer John Byro an Assyrian who out of loneliness had learned to speak Armenian, whose horse is stolen or borrowed by Aram and his cousin Murad. And of course, there is the immortal Theodore Badal in 70,000 Assyrians, one of Soroyan's greatest stories. Theodore Badal himself, 70,000 Assyrians, himself Assyria and man, standing in a barber shop in San Francisco in 1933 and being still himself the whole race. Tonight's lecture is another in a series of talks given in memory of uh, Emmanuel P. Varanya, novelist, uh, professor of English literature at Ohio State University, longtime Nasser board member, and a benefactor, and a tireless advocate for Armenian studies, and a native of the Urmia region. Professor Varanyan's most famous work, The Well of Ararat, which Nasser republished in 2005 with an introduction by Eden Nabi and a biographical sketch by Professor Richard Fry, is in large part an evocation or recreation of Armenian village life in the Urmia region. If you've never read the book, you should pick up a copy. It is, as they say, famous for a reason, and we have plenty that we'd be happy to sell you. Now, our speaker tonight is Dr. Nicholas Aljalou. We got to know Dr. Aljalou a couple of years ago when he was in the area and spent some time at Nasser. We're really pleased to welcome him back here tonight. He's an Australian Assyrian who received a PhD in Assyrian Syriac studies from the University of Sydney this year. And he also holds an MA from Leiden University. His photographs have been used in art and history books about the Middle East, including Christopher Baumer's The Church of the East and Illustrated History of Assyrian Christianity. So, without further delay, please welcome Dr. Nicholas Aljilda. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I'd like to say this is uh, more of a turnout than I expected. Um, I, for me, it's very exciting to be here. My first time uh, at NASA was about five years ago. And um, since then, you know, I've always wanted to be you know, part of something here. This is a great institution and you guys are doing great work. I'd like to thank NASA and everybody else that was involved in um, making tonight happen. Now, while much information and research has enlightened our understanding of Armenians from Isfahan, especially because of their importance for trade, little other information exists in English about Armenians living in other parts of Iran, even Armenians in Tabriz a prosperous and important urban community. Like the Assyrians, who were largely based in villages throughout the Middle East, the Armenians of the Urmia region led agrarian lives for much of the 19th century. And even when they moved to the cities, which were hubs of agrarian wholesale markets in wheat and raisins, they often engaged in trade that involved their village roots. Assyrians and Armenians, we can all admit, have had a love-hate relationship throughout much of their history. According to popular legends, the kings Bel and Haik, who founded the Armenian nation, fought each other. Bel was the king of the Assyrians. Then the kings Nasor and Aram, one Assyrian, one Armenian, again fought each other in the story of how Lavash was made. Then you have the story of Queen Shamiram and King Ara and how Queen Shamiram stopped the Armenians speaking their language for 40 years. However, you have it going the other way since the, term, uh, since the dawn of Christianity. At least three of the Catholicoses of Echmiadzin were of Assyrian ancestry, as well as the royal family of the Armenian kingdom of Vaspurakan, the Artsurunis. At the same time as being so different to one another linguistically, 
and in terms of religious sects, they are also two of the most similar peoples in the Near East in terms of culture and appearance. In his short story, 70,000 Assyrians, which Mark kindly mentioned, William Sar Saroyan stated that Assyrians have noses like our noses, eyes like our eyes, and hearts like our hearts. So just showing you some maps of Iran, and the highlighted area is West Azerbaijan province. So that's a close up of the province, showing you where Ormia is, right next to the lake, and the border with Turkey. Then you have Salamas, which also had a large Salamis, which also had a large Armenian population. This sort of gives you an idea of the terrain from the air, which is mostly mountainous, around very flat and very fertile plains. Now, the Urmia region in Iran's West Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan province is one of the most diverse areas in the country. And in addition to indigenous Assyrian and Armenian communities, it has also been home to Azeris, Kurds, Persians, and Jews. The complete ethnic breakdown of the area's pre-World War, pre World War I population of 230,000 included at least 78,000 Assyrians and 20,000 Armenians. It is the Assyrians and Armenians who are the focus of my presentation this evening since they have always shared close ties with one another. As a result of the Treaty of Turkmenchai in 1828, which ended the Russian and Persian Wars, a large number of the original Armenians who were living in the Urmia region immigrated to the Russian Empire. I think, if I'm not mistaken, roughly 54,000. And they migrated mostly to the area around what is now Yerevan. So already by the middle of the 1800s, their community in Urmia was already losing its former dominance in the region. A century ago, this area was dotted with Christian villages populated mostly by ethnic Assyrians and Armenians. Historically, the Armenians formed the majority population in the districts of Salamas, Chahara, and Somaye, which are basically, there's Salamas, there's Chahara, and there's Somaye. And they possessed their own settlements as far as the Shaharchai district in the Urmia plain, from where on the Assyrians predominated. I'm going to explain these uh, districts in a second. Now the Assyrians on the other hand once predominated in the Urmia and Soldos plains and in the mountainous frontier districts from Baradost as far south as Ushnu. So, as far south as Ushnu, extending northwards as far as Salamas, where they were originally in the minority. Throughout most of these areas, however, Assyrians and Armenians lived side by side in shared settlements, often praying at one another's churches and burying their dead in the same cemeteries. Since they were both Christian groups living under Islamic domination, they considered each other co-religionists and cooperated with one another on that front. It is widely believed that Monophysites and Nestorians, quote unquote, could never get along Yet in Urmia, the Monophysite Armenians and Nestorian Assyrians had an unspoken rule of intercommunal cooperation and coexistence. Thus we notice that Armenian communities with no priests were served by Assyrian ones, and vice versa. They would pray in each other's churches and attend each other's special occasions, whether festive or mournful. Moreover, Assyrians and Armenians both venerate many of the same saints and held many of the same churches in high regard, and it is not unusual for one church building in a certain village to pass from one community to another on more than one occasion, or for the lines to be blurred as to which church belongs to which community. Often, when the last Assyrians leave a certain village in the Urmia region, they would entrust the keys of their churches and properties to Assyrians that remained. Marriage also, whilst often frowned upon by elders from both communities, has also been quite common since the earliest of times. Additionally, those Assyrians who live close to Armenians or who have mixed ancestry also speak Armenian and vice versa. Some were even literate in one another's languages. For instance, 
the tomb of an Assyrian youth from Iriawa, which was the village of the late Emmanuel Varandian, states the following. Joseph, son of Baba, lived 16 years. He was literate in three languages, Persian, Armenian, and Syriac. It was the heavy concentration of Assyrians and Armenians in Persian Azerbaijan, along with their proximity to other major clusters of Christians in the Ottoman Empire, which in the 19th century attracted the attention of Western missions who appealed to the imperial aspirations of their Christian governments for funding and other means of support. Soon, these missionaries, who had come to evangelize the Assyrians and Armenians, found out that the Assyrians, more so than the Armenians, provided them with the fertile ground they needed for proselytization, since their impoverished patriarchate was unable to compete. The missions were also met with fierce opposition from local Armenian priests, and the largest and most influential missions belonged to the American Presbyterians, the French Catholics, and the Russian Orthodox. It is worthy to note that the Chaldean major seminary opened by the French Catholic mission in the town of Khosrawa at Salamas in 1846 taught a curriculum that included lessons in Armenian as well as Latin, French, classical Syriac, biblical studies, philosophy and theology. In the autumn of 1870, the New York-based Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions then expanded its field of operation throughout Iran, which had been previously more popular with the Assyrians and had also begun to aim at proselytizing the Armenians more actively. By 1892, the number of its mission schools in Iran had risen to 120, enrolling 2,800 mostly Assyrian and Armenian students. These and similar educational institutions were to have a profound effect on both of these communities throughout the region, bringing about a cultural renaissance and an era of prosperity. This was cut short, however, by the fateful events of the First World War, during which the Ottomans invaded the area twice. During the first invasion in 1915, a large number of Assyrians and Armenians in the region suffered atrocities and massacres. Most notably, in the villages of Ada and Sapurhan and at Ardishai, where a number of young girls drowned themselves in the lake to avoid being raped. At Gulpashan, 75 men were exterminated in the Christian cemetery and in the Armenian town of Haftavan, the, which the Ottomans used as a military base, they found thousands or maybe hundreds of corpses in the wells. Between 1915 and 1918, hundreds of Armenian volunteers joined an armed force commanded by Assyrian general Aga Petros, which policed and defended the area. Aga Petros was in, con uh, in constant contact with Armenian general Antranik Pasha and did his best to maintain Christian control of the Urmia region, even after having been abandoned by the Russians due to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Eventually, the forces gave up as their ammunition ran out. Those Assyrians and Armenians who managed to survive massacre, hunger, disease and the general fear and panic that plagued the area as a result of the war abandoned their homes on the 1st of August 1918, fleeing to the Persian town of Hamadan and then to Iraq amongst a convoy of 90,000 refugees, Assyrian and Armenian. Of the 17,000 Christians who remained in Urmia and its surrounding villages at the time, the Ottomans reinvaded in 1918. Only 600 managed to survive the massacres, and many of them returned to their homes after the war had ended. In June 1919, Reverend Muller of the American Presbyterian Mission counted 184 Assyrian and Armenian Christians remaining in the Salamas district alone, only three of whom were adult males. Most of them had been killed. In 1922, the Persian government allowed groups of Assyrians and Armenians to return from the Bakuba refugee camp in Iraq and resettle their villages. Whilst the number of Armenians had already made their way over to the United States or decided to stay put in Baghdad, many of them patiently waited along with Assyrian returnees in cities such as Hamadan, Qazvin, Kermanshah and Tabriz until the government deemed it safe for a certain number of them to return. The Persian authorities, however, had put quotas in place determining just how many Assyrians or Armenians could return to ensure that they would never again be an important element in the area's demography. 
since the Armenians that returned did not meet the limits set, and more Assyrians desired to return than the quota allowed, some Assyrians changed their surnames to Armenian ones just to be able to get back to their homes. The Urmia region's Assyrians and Armenians were again caught up in the violence that marked the rise and fall of the Azerbaijan People's Republic. So, just uh, before I move on, just showing you a basic uh, photograph of what the terrain looks around the Urmia plain. You can see the mountains that surround the plain and the plain itself and what the villages over there would have looked like. That is a half Assyrian, half Armenian girl in Urmia. Assyrian and Armenian young children in the village of Iriava, the village of uh, uh, Emmanuel Varandian, playing basketball in the same courtyard as the Assyrian and Armenian churches which stand side by side. Another person who's half Armenian, half Assyrian, just showing you the, uh, the great abundance of fruit in the region. And those were his parents. Grapes. Amazingly huge. <laughs> and those were his parents. Nikolai on the right, who was Armenian, and then the mother, who was Assyrian. And I mentioned how when As Armenians would leave a village, they would leave the keys to their churches with the Assyrians. This is uh, the village of uh, Pakabailu, just north of Urmia. And the lady there is the last Christian in the village. She's an Assyrian, and she has the keys to the Armenian church. Now, this is just the skyline of the city of Urmia, as it looks today. You can see the steeple of the Assyrian uh, Church of the East, St. Mary's Church. And I'm going to be talking about its courtyard in a second. Now, I was talking about the Azerbai Azerbaijan People's Republic and its fall in 1946. It was a Soviet puppet state. And basically, when it fell and the Persian troops re-entered the area, they killed many of the local Christians. Well, the Christians who got involved, of course. Um, so including Assyrians and Armenians. A 31-year-old Armenian man who died as a result of the situation was buried in the yard of the Old Virgin Mary Assyrian Church at Urmia, and his gravestone, which you can see here, can be still seen there today. So an Armenian, again, buried in the churchyard of an Assyrian church. In addition, beside another Assyrian church dedicated to the Virgin Mary, in the old village of Charbash, there are eight gravestones belonging to ten Assyrians and one local Armenian. Seven of them were killed around 4 p.m. on December 15, 1946, in a sudden attack on the local, local Azerbaijan Democratic Party headquarters by Iranian gendarmes and a tank belonging to their security forces. The epitaph of the Armenian, which bears parallel inscriptions in Assyrian and Armenian, reads as follows. Well, I couldn't translate the Armenian, so I've translated the Assyrian. The mighty youth Khosro, son of Agob Tatavosyan of Chaharbash, lived 23 years. He was cruelly murdered by gendarmes for the sake of freedom, 15th of December 1946. Thus we witnessed that, during the period, both Assyrian and Armenian men were caught up in a conflict which was not their own, and were brutally murdered by Iranian security forces. Consequently, the Assyrians and Armenians of the Urmia region continued a steady exodus away from their traditional homes to the large urban centers of Iran and afterwards to the diaspora as they lost all hope in the recreation of their community's strength prior to the, world, prior to the First World War. Today, there are currently between five and 10,000 Assyrians remaining in the Urmia region.